So here in Genesis chapter 34, this entire chapter deals with this one story revolving around Dinah, which is one of Jacob's daughters, is a daughter of Leah, right? And we see this whole thing, and, and there's, a, there's a few points I'm going to want to make. But if you remember last week in Genesis chapter 33, is after he, uh, you know, Jacob had met with Esau, everything was good, and he goes his way and he goes into the land, and then he, he sets up a place, and then he goes, he moves from that place right outside of Shechem, and he sets up his altar, and he basically pitches his tent outside of, of Shechem. So now, this is where he's residing, outside of this city in Shechem. Um, I don't think it's a very big city, because they're able to destroy, you know, the, the sons of Jacob, his, his 11 sons, because Joseph is, is, or I mean, Benjamin isn't even born yet are able to destroy the, the household, basically. It's a smaller city. But um, they're outside of this city. And let's just jump into this in verse number one. It says, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now, I think this is the very first mistake, if not them, you know, him deciding to just live right up next to Shechem and these people who were ungodly. I mean, they were, they were the heathen. They were not people who worshipped the Lord. He had to set up his own altar. They were not people who uh, followed the Lord. They were, they were heathen people. But he joins up next to him, and then the next thing he knows, his daughter wants to go, it says, and see the daughters of the land. She's like, well, I want to go out and make friends. I want to go out and meet the other daughters and, and spend time with the heathen and go out into the world and see what they're like and just kind of learn their ways. And this alone is, is a big mistake. And we need to be careful who you let your daughters keep company with. Sons and daughters, but here we're seeing with Dinah, you know, she goes, she's keeping company with these girls. She, she's getting to learn the ways of, of the daughters of the land. And I don't believe this is in here by accident. And then the very next thing that we see is she's committing fornication with Shechem. And then there's this whole fallout of that whole situation where, where just all kinds of bad things start to happen as a result of this. And it all started with her going out and just spending time and getting to know the daughters of the land. And that's why I'm going to be very careful about who my daughters become friends with. You know, they're not just going to be friends with any random person. They're not going to be friends with the, the most worldly, unsaved kids because they're going to influence them. All, any friends, anyone who you decide to spend time with is going to have an influence on you and how you act and the things you say and the things that you like. It's human nature, and especially with kids, when they're not as good at discerning right from wrong, you, know, you try to teach them as best you can, but you also have to have some level of protection, especially when they're younger. I mean, my daughters are all real young. They're under six, so I'm going to have a, a very protective view on who is going to be their friends. Now, we let them play with kids at the park and stuff like that, but that's different than actually going and like being, being a friend to somebody and starting to learn more about them. We already have to tell them, um, you know, there's the, the kids these days are literally... And, and, you know, in, in Jeremiah 10, verse 2, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. That we're not supposed to be learning their ways. And, and kids in general, your average unsaved kid, this day is way more wicked and, and, and into more evil, bad things than kids, you know, even 30, 30 years ago growing up. Now, I don't think, I mean, if you're saved and you're, and you're trying to raise Christian children, you shouldn't just let them go off into the world and just make friends with the world. Because if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God, is what the Bible says. But these days, specifically, even in the culture that we live in, the society we live in, you know what I'm talking about. You see these girls, they're literally dressing like little prostitutes. And it's bizarre. And, and, and the parents just think, oh, it's so cute. And they're wearing these skirts that like barely even cover their rear end. And, they're, and, and these tops that are already just low cut. Now, obviously, with little kids, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing to expose, but they're getting used to dressing in a certain style and a certain fashion that they see their, you know, these, these music stars, especially, going around and tramping around on stage. 
They listen to the filthy sodomites. And that's pretty much all that you're going to find on the radio these days when it comes to popular music and they have the hip hop and all this other stuff. And, and, these, and I wish I could just come up with all the names of these popular, like the Miley Cyruses who's up on stage and literally pretty much conducting uh, an act that is ought to be done in the bedroom in private is virtually doing these things up on stage in front of everybody to see and complete almost completely naked but naked by the bible standards no doubt in almost nothing and even doing like satanic rituals in their performances on stage and this is the music that little girls are listening to today and they're looking up to this even at events like the Super Bowl I mean they're coming out riding on the, the, the great whores riding on the beast and this is acceptable in today's society and it's madness what has happened to our country where this is entertainment this is prime time entertainment have the whore come out on the beast and this is what everybody likes and this is what everyone wants to see and it's satanic rituals it's not even hidden it's not even obscured it's just outright satanism a lot of things are satanic but you call them satanic because they're subtle and they're gonna drive you away from God but this is just downright evil and wickedness that's going on in paganism that's being promoted and this is what kids these days are being brought up with and it's accepted and parents are saying, yeah, that's fine. And they're listening to the same thing or whatever. It's filth. It's sodomy. And this is what the kids are learning. And I'm not going to let my daughters even be friends with people like that who just think that that's okay. That there's nothing wrong with that. Because guess what's going to happen? It's going to rub off on them. They're going to see, oh, well, my friend thinks this is really cool. And my friend dresses like this. And my friend does that. And it's a natural instinct to just kind of want to be accepted and learn what they're doing and want to do the things that they're doing too. Well, they're having so much fun with this. I want to do, I want to do that too. You have to be very careful who your kids are spending their time with and who becomes their friend. And I don't care if this world says, oh, well, you know, you're being, you're being real protective, overprotective of myself. Look, I am going to be protective of my children because I don't want them to turn out like Dinah committing fornication with some heathen. Because that's exactly what happens in this story. As a result of her going out, well, I just want to go out and see the daughters of the land. Next thing you know, she's shacking up with Shechem. And let's see what happens here, because I want to explain this part too. Look at verse number two. It says, And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country saw her he took her and lay with her and defiled her now i've heard people say that they think that he rapes her right that he forces her i don't believe that at all about this story now you can look at the language and it says well he took her and he lay with her and defiled her okay so some people might say well because he it says he took her it means he forced her, but it doesn't. It, the Bible never says in this whole story, we're going to see as we read it again and we go through the verses, it never mentions that he forces her. It just says here that he took her. Now, he took her and lay with her. I mean, if a guy says, hey, come, you know, come with me, you're taking her and, and, and laying with her. And then it says, and he defiled her. Now, again, that word defiled doesn't necessarily have to mean that he forced her either. Defiled just means he made her unclean. She's, she's dirty. She was pure and she's no longer pure. She's defiled. And we'll see some other references about being defiled. Like in Levi You don't have to turn or stay in Genesis, but in Leviticus 18.20, the Bible says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. So he's saying if you just lie, nothing about forcing your neighbor's wife, but just if you lie down with your neighbor's wife, you're going to defile yourself. You're going to make yourself unclean, impure. And in Leviticus 19.31, even nothing that has to do with, with that type of sin, Leviticus 19.31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So that defiling is just making you unclean for some reason. It does it has nothing to do, it doesn't, it doesn't imply that because it says she's defiled, that it means he must have forced her. That's not what that means. It just means that she's unclean. And um, as a result of this action, of this fornication that takes place, verse 3 says, And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. We see here, 
His affection is towards her. He really likes this girl. But as a heathen, you know, the heathen world today, they think that's not a big deal. I mean, people these days, even in this society, in this heathen world, it's not a Christian world. I'm sorry. This is a heathen world that will tell you, well, as long as you guys love each other, and it's just become acceptable for people to live together outside of wedlock and say, oh, well, we love each other. So if you love each other, then it's okay to commit fornication, and they have no problem with that. No problem at all. Now, do people still get married? Yeah, of course they do. She comes, wanted to marry Dinah. But they didn't seem to have a problem with him just, just sleeping with her and them lying together. But it says here, he loved her. He spake kindly unto her. Not very indicative of someone who forces women. Verse number four, and Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. Now, turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter number 22. Because this is tied in with this story, with at least when people think that he's forcing her. The God haters have warped, have a warped view of the Bible. Where they'll 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 claim that, you know, the Bible says that if a man forces a woman, then he must marry her, right? And if you've, if you've seen atheists and just other people who despise God's word and want to try to make fun of it, they'll say, oh yeah, the, Bible's, the Bible promotes, you know, people when they rape someone that they just need to marry them and that's God's law and they try to, try to mock God's law and say that that's what the Bible says, but that's not what the Bible says. We're going to see what the Bible says about this, this subject, about a man forcing another, another woman, a woman. Verse number 22 says, If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. So this is covering adultery, right? This woman's already married. This guy goes and he lies with her. And it says nothing about forcing her, but they just lies. He commits adultery with her. Well, what happens when they're found out? You put the woman and the man both to death, the adulterer and the adulteress. Amen. That's what God's law says. Verse 23. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. Again, committing adultery. But what they're explaining here is this is someone who's married, but they haven't consummated the marriage yet of coming together and having that physical act. They've been married. Just like Joseph and Mary were espoused, they were married, but before they came together, that's when Mary was conceived of the Holy Ghost. She was still a virgin, even though they were married. Now, it's harder to understand that in our culture because normally, even if people are virgin going into marriage, that, that consummation happens r really quickly, typically after a marriage. But in these days, that wasn't the way they did it. There was tend to be a longer time period would go by between the marriage and the actual consummation of the marriage. So he's just explaining here that, look, even if she's a virgin and they haven't consummated the marriage yet and someone goes and lies with her, then they're both going to be put to death. And what they're getting into now is, well, if they're in the city, you know, and she's a virgin, she can't claim that he forced her because within the city, you have to just, I mean, all you got to do is scream out and cry out because they're close enough together. Someone's going to hear you and they're going to know. And then you're, you know, someone will, will, will be able to say, do something about it and say, you know, stop that event from happening or whatever. And, and your name will be clear because you didn't really want it to happen. And it, and it continues on and explains it even further. Verse 25, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her. So now we're seeing the forcing, right? This is something that is definitely against the will of the woman. If a man forces this woman, it says, and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. So it's saying, you know, you don't, you don't punish the woman. She didn't want it. She was forced into this. But the man's going to be put to death. So the rapist gets the death penalty, according to the Bible. Amen. That's the way it should be today also. But look what it says, verse 26. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. 
There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this man saying, when someone else lies in wait and they kill their, you know, kill someone else, that's just like this. When they, when someone, when the rapist comes and, and just, you know, forces a woman, it's the same thing that, you know, she's not guilty of anything. We see this already in the Bible spelling out when he forces her, right? This is the punishment. It doesn't say he's then going to marry her, does it? No, it says that he's going to be put to death, but nothing's going to be done to the woman because she didn't do anything wrong. Verse 27, For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So you just assume, you have to, you're going to have to assume that she cried out because when she's out away from everybody, you, you're not going to be able to prove that she didn't cry out. right? But this is even saying if, when he forces her. Right, this isn't saying it's consensual. This is saying he forced her. They were out in the field and no one even knew that he forced her because she cried out, but there was no one around to hear her. Verse 28, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. And it says, a man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. So this, these verses are the ones that people will go to to try to say, oh yeah, the Bible teaches that you know, the rapist has, is, is, is supposed to marry the woman that he rapes. This is ridiculous. Let's look at the wording of what this says. Because we already dealt with the consequence of the rapist. It's death. This says, if a man find a damsel as a virgin, which is not betrothed, then lay hold on her. So here, lay hold on her. Does that mean he forces her? No. Just laying hold on someone, you know, holding them, grabbing them. I mean, in order to commit this act, you're going to have to lay a hold, you know, hold the person anyways, right? It says, lay hold on her and lie with her and they be found. This is fornication. He finds a girl that he likes, takes hold on her and says, come on, let's, you know, let's go do this or whatever, and they go do it. And then someone finds out about it. He's saying, okay, well, you commit fornication, but now you need to pay the dowry unto the father, the 50 shekels of silver, and you have to marry that girl. Because you've already done the act, but you, you've got to make it right now and, and marry her and saying, you can't divorce her. You, know, you, 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 gotta, you, know, you decided to do this act preemptively. Now you have to marry her and, and you know, you're going to stay together. And that's God's law. So it's not that hard to understand, but the reason why that people say that so much, it's not because of what the King James Bible says. I have here... <laughs> In my pulpit, the a parallel Bible. This one is the NIV and the Living Bible. And then this one that I received. I, I have a cross that says it's a good news Bible. I have the bad news Bible. This is the one I received in my Presbyterian church when I went through confirmation. This was this was that fun Bible that they gave me to read. Because, you know, it's a little bit easier to understand, right? I mean, I was, I was a teenager, and the Bible's just real difficult to understand. So they gave me this Bible that says in verse 28 of Deuteronomy 22, Suppose a man is caught raping a girl who is not engaged. He is to pay the girl's father of the bride price of 50 pieces of silver and she is to become his wife because he forced her to have intercourse with him he can never divorce her as long as he lives isn't that just so easy to understand now isn't it great to hear that god's word now is god's holy law is promoting people when they rape somebody now you just got to marry him hey great woman i just got raped now i'm going to spend the rest of my life with this person he can never divorce me isn't that good news? That's, that's great news, right? From the good news Bible. The good news of God's law. If a man rapes me, now I have to just spend my rest of my life with him. It's ridiculous. This is trash. The NIV, the, new li the, the living version, or the 
the, the Living Bible, too. Same exact thing. It says, if a man rapes a girl who is not engaged and is caught in the act, he must pay a fine to the girl's father and marry her. He may never divorce her. That was the Living Bible. NIV says, if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay the girl's father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the girl, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. This is a joke. And this is, you know, when people try to bring up and say, oh yeah, the Bible says that uh, if a man rapes a woman, then he has to marry her and they're going to be staying together. And that's, that's what the Bible says. No, it's not what the Bible says. That's what these perversions say. These perverted, twisted words that are not the Bible, that is Satan's attack on God's word, says that garbage. But look at how much damage these beloved versions have brought in the reproach against God's holy commandments. These do. Don't think, oh, it's just a little bit easier to understand. It says that if a man rapes a woman, he has to marry her. That is a joke. It's a disgrace. It's a shame. God's word does not say anything like that. Amen. Don't get fooled by these false perversions. It's not just a minor difference. Well, you believe that, I believe this. No. That's a huge difference in the Bible. Someone committing fornication versus somebody raping somebody is a world of difference. God's law is perfect. But this is what the naysayers will say and the, and the, and the mockers will, will turn to to say, see, look at how ridiculous your Bible is. What kind of God is that? And with that, I'd have to agree with them if that's what they said, but that's not what the Bible says. It all, and, and these books are so stupid too because when you read them, it already says that in the previous verse, if a man forces a woman, you know, and rapes her, then he's going to be put to death, but not her. It's when a woman committed adultery, right? A man and a woman, they both got put to death. When this guy rapes someone, he gets put to death because it says that he forces her. But then in the next verse it's saying, look, then if people who aren't, who aren't married commit fornication, then they have to get married. It's not that difficult to understand. But why would he repeat basically the same thing? And in one instance, it's a death penalty for the man. The other one, he's got to marry her. It, it just doesn't even make any sense. Turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel chapter 13. Because the other reason I want to point out is why I don't think that this story is talking about rape with Shechem and with Dinah, why I think this is completely consensual is all of the evidence that we're going to we see in the chapter. We saw we already read the verses that said that Shechem loved Dinah. That he wanted to marry her. That that he spoke well unto her, right? And 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 he treated her in a way that you would think, well, when somebody loves another person, that's how they're going to treat them. As opposed to to a man that that forces another woman. Someone that a man that forces a woman treats them like an object. It's not love at all. I know I didn't even have to say that, but it's a violation. It's someone being violated and treating them with zero respect, completely against their will, but they're just doing something because they want it themselves and they, and they care about themselves. They don't care about that person. What we've seen in this story was Shechem expressing care and love for her that he actually did love her. Another reason, but look at 2 Samuel 13 because we're going to see another story in the Bible where Someone is forced. And we're going to see the repercussions of this. 2 Samuel chapter number 13, verse number 1, says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister, 
whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend, isn't that familiar, whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. We see how friends are kind of getting people into trouble here. We saw Dinah was going out to make friends with the daughters of the land. She ends up getting in trouble. And here we see Amnon's got a friend, a friend named Jonadab. Because at first, what, we, what we're seeing in this story is Amnon's in love with his half-sister, with Tamar. It's Absalom's sister because David had, had children by different wives, by different women. Amnon is just vexed. He's so in love with, with Tamar. It says he's like he's lovesick for her, right? He's just completely infatuated with her. But because she's his sister, he's just he's not going to do anything about it. He's like basically saying, there's nothing I can do. She's my sister. But now he's got this friend, right, who's going to talk in his ear and kind of tell him what he should do. He was a subtle man. Verse number four, and he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat. And dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her hand. So Amnon lay down, and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. So he's basically just pretending that he's sick. And this is, this is the story that, that Jonadab said for him to do. He's like, just, just fake it like you're sick. And then just ask your father, ask David to send Tamar to bring you some food. Then you'll be alone together in the room and then you can have what you want, right? It's, this, is, this is your plan, your, your, your trick to lure her in. To, to get her into this place. So he does that. He fakes to be sick. He goes to David, you know, you know, all I need, I'm not feeling real well. If you could just please send Tamar in here to bring me some food, I think that'll help me feel a lot better. And it says in verse 8, So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laid down, and she took flour and kneaded it, and made cakes in his sight, and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him. But he refused to eat. He wasn't hungry. That's not what he cared about. And Amnon said, have out all men from me. And they went out, every man from him. And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber, that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come, lie with me, my sister. So now he's, he, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's, he takes her. He took hold on her, right? But... He didn't force her. He, said, he, he propositions her and says, you know, come lie with me. But look at her answer. Verse 12, And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not this folly. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Howbeit, he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Now, when the Bible's talking about people forcing a woman, it, 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 it always uses that language that he forced her. So back when we saw in Deuteronomy, taking hold on a woman who's not married and lying with her, it never says that he forced her, right? As, as these perversions said. But here we see that he does force her. He doesn't listen to her. She says no, clearly. She said, don't do this. Don't be a fool. Don't, you know, don't do this wickedness. And then it says, he lay with her. Verse, look at verse 15, though. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. So remember, I mean, Amnon was in love with her. And loved her so much, he was lovesick over her. But then when he forced her, when he just took what he wanted from her, he despised her. He, ha he hated her even more than, than he had ever loved her. Because he didn't do it the right way. He took her, forced her. And this is the mindset that he has. 
that, that and I believe this isn't the mindset of, of all rapists when you when you treat a woman like that and you just force her like that how can you love them he hated her and he showed that he ended up hating her and he hated her more it's, it's, it's you know even seeing her now is just gonna be a reminder of what he did and just that shame getting thrown back into her fit into his face and he's just like get out of here verse 16 and she said unto him there is no cause this evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this young woman out from me and bolt the door after her. So after he commits this act of, of forcing her, he ends up hating her. And again, this is what we see in, in an example of someone being forced in the Bible. But then when we go back, flip back if you would to Genesis 34, we don't see that out of Shechem. We don't see this kind of mindset at all. We see, we see the exact opposite. We see that he loves her. We see that he wants to marry her. We see that, you know, and, and wants to continue being with her and speaking well unto her and doing all these different things. So verse 4, Genesis 34 Reads, and Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Don, Dinah his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. So Jacob doesn't really say anything about this while his sons are still out in the field, but he finds out that his daughter just had committed fornication with Shechem, but now Shechem wants to, wants to marry her. Verse 7 says, and the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. Now, again, nowhere it says, and just notice this as we read through this whole chapter again, it never says that he forced her anywhere. You would, the best you can do is maybe try to imply that somehow. But that's why I'm showing you, I don't believe for a second that he forced her. Because... What they should be angry about would be the, the forcing of her. And you would think that at some point it would say, even when they concoct this plan to go kill all the men, in somewhere in that they would mention because he forced her, right? If that's what actually happened. But no. And the reason why I think some people also have a hard time understanding this is because of the acceptance of fornication today and people have a hard time even thinking, well, why would they want to go and kill these guys? I mean, they just slept together, right? I mean, that's all they did. I mean, it, look, it's a big deal. And it should still be looked at as a big deal when someone commits fornication and they lose their virgin. And, and she's lying just with, with, with the heathen of the land. It's a big deal. Let's keep reading. Verse number 8, And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her, give her him to wife, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you, and ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get you possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father, and unto her brethren, let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. So he's go basically he's saying, Look, I really love your daughter. You know, let's, let's start mixing, let our families mix together. You could give her daughters unto us. We'll give ours unto you. And, and, you know, whatever it is that you want me to do, I'll do it because I love your daughter so much. I mean, this is how he's coming to, to Jacob and, and Jacob's sons. And he's just approaching them in this manner and just, just being, trying to be humble with them and trying to just do whatever it is that they want, right? And it says... Um, and verse 12, Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. He's like, all I care about is marrying your daughter. Name the price. Whatever it is that you want for, as a dowry for her, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll give it to you. But just let me marry your daughter. He did, I mean, I believe he honestly loved her. And we could see that's evident in everything that he's saying. I don't think he forced her. He loved her. Verse 13, And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully, and said, Because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. So they're still angry about it. Even though he loves her so much, they're angry because, look, 
He went about it completely the wrong way. Obviously, if you want to, if you love someone and want to marry them, then you marry them first and then have that relationship second. You go and ask permission first. You don't just, just act impulsively and, and commit that act because that does defile a person. And we're going to get into that a little bit. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's keep reading here. Verse 14. And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you, if ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then will we take our daughter, and we will be gone. So, and it says in their words, pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son, and the young man deferred not to do the thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. So again, a little bit more to Shechem's character, it says that he was more honorable than, than everyone in his father's house. Like, he really wanted to do this, and he's saying, okay, that sounds like a fair deal. We'll get circumcised. So the, you know, the sons are saying, okay, okay, look. We can't just get married here and, and start intermingling unless you guys decide that you're going to get circumcised. You need to be like us. Now, remember, the, the circumcision was a symbol of their separation from the world. And that's, and that's one thing that set them apart. And um, they're just using this as an excuse because they, they had no intention of giving Dinah to them to, for him to be his wife. Not at all. They're, they're planning this because after they get circumcised, then they're going to be you know, in pain and not able to, to, to walk around and, and act normal and be able to defend themselves properly after, as grown men, getting circumcised, having to deal with that and, and deal with the healing process of doing something like that, that, that kind of puts them at a major disadvantage. And that's why they said, you guys, every male, everybody needs to have this done in order for this to take place. So she comes all for it. He says he's honored. <laughs> and, but that tells you the honor that his father's house had. I mean, if he's the most honorable and he's sitting here just committing fornication and then going and asking for to be married, you know, the heathen land, Dinah should have never been going out and spending time with these people if that's the most honorable. I mean, hey, at least she found the most honorable man, right? But it was not, not, not that good, not a good man to, to be with to begin with because of the fornication. And yes, that is a serious sin. Verse 20 says, And Hamor and Shechem his son came unto the gate of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us, therefore let them dwell in the land and trade therein. For the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent unto us, for to dwell with us and to be one people. If every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised, Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them and they will dwell with us. So, Hamor and Shechem go back to try to convince the people that they all need to get circumcised too. Because Shechem's the one that wants to marry. I, you know, if I was to be like, well, you're the one that wants to marry. Why don't you just get circumcised? And they're saying, well, look, they won't do this. They won't allow us to marry their daughters unless we all get circumcised and be like them. And, he's, and he starts bringing up, look, they've got a lot of substance. They've got a lot of cattle. They've got a lot of stuff. Look, this will be ours. They're saying, you know, if we, start, if we start giving them our daughters and we start taking their daughters, we're going to increase with their substance. So he pitches it to them like that, saying, hey, this is going to be a real good, this is going to be real lucrative for us. This is a good thing to do. Let's join up with them and, and all that substance that they have, we'll, we'll get to partake in that as we start marrying their daughters and they start marrying ours. So he convinces them. It says, and, Hamor, and, and unto Hamor and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised all that went out of the gate of his city. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, so we notice Dinah's like literal immediate brethren, Simeon and, and Levi, of, of both of Leah, right? Leah gave birth to these sons and to Dinah. They were her true brethren. 
It says, They took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. So they waited the three days to where they're going to be in the most pain and in the, the worst point of their recovery in this whole process. And then they, they go in and they kill everybody. They kill, all, they kill everybody. It says, well, here it says they, they slew all the males. But then in verse 26, it says, And they slew Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. So we see Dinah was already in Shechem's house. She was hanging out there. Now, if he had forced her, I, I, don't, I highly doubt that he would be forcing her to live with him, right? And then going and asking permission to marry her. It just doesn't make sense. She was there voluntarily, and, and the, the act that she committed should never have been done, but it wasn't a rape type thing. Again, we just see more evidence of this as we read the chapter. Verse 27, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. So they killed all the men and they took the women and children they just took them for captives and took all of their goods and cattle and everything else. Verse 30 says, And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I, being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me. And I shall be destroyed, I and my house. He's saying, look, the other people land are going to hear about what you did, about just coming and destroying this people. And they're going to band up together. And now they're all going to come against us to, to, to judge us and to bring justice against us for killing all these people. Because that wasn't right what you did to just go and kill everybody just because, you know, everyone else is going to say, look, all they, did, all they did was sleep with this girl and he tried to marry her. And then they came in and killed them all. He said, you made me to stink. The people around about are going to want us dead as a, as a bunch of fugitives, right? In verse 31, and they said, should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? And again, just even that phrase alone was saying, well, should you just deal with her as a harlot, as a, as a whore, right? Now, when someone uses a phrase like that, and again, I, this might be my last point on the whole forcing thing, but people don't, don't generally think of going to a harlot to force them, right? That's not why you go. You go because you don't care about them. You want to, to do your thing or whatever. You want to have that relation with a person and you pay them and, and that's what you get and that's, and that's a harlot and they're saying like, you know, they're just treating her like she's a harlot. Like it's valueless. Like she's just, that's all she's good for. And that's not all she's good for and they're saying that's, that's a reproach and that's, you know, they've defiled her and, and everything else. You know, they're, they're, they, they see that as a serious sin. Now, when you commit fornication and do not reserve that act for marriage, I believe you are dealing with people as with an harlot. And that may be tough to think about and tough to consider, especially if, if you're guilty of doing this. But look, that's the truth. When you have this relation outside of marriage, whether you think it or not, you're dealing with that person like you deal with a harlot. Because of the fact you are not putting the, 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 the emphasis on purity and the meaning of two people becoming one flesh and everything that goes along with that is designed. God designed that to happen only between a man and a wife and that's something special. That's a relation that you should have only with that one person for your whole life. Because there's a lot of things that go along with a lot of emotional attachment. You literally become one flesh. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We need to get back to having an attitude about fornication that's biblical. Because the world is trying to tell us it's fine, it's normal, it's no big deal. But it's not.
And for all the adults in this room, you know, everybody here is married that's an adult. And, you know, some or all, I don't know, doesn't matter, have, have already made this mistake. But my children need to hear this. And we need this reinforced in our minds too. Because this is something that, that needs to be understood and common among Christians that this is not acceptable. Fornication is a wicked sin and is not acceptable. No matter what the world says. Look at verse number 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. This is what Paul was saying to the Corinthians. He's saying, look, I already wrote unto you not to keep company with people who sleep around, not to keep company with fornicators. But he goes on to explain, he says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He's saying, look, that's what the world is like. He's saying, I don't mean you just can't sit down with anybody in the entire world. He said, and then you just have to get out of the world because the world is full of this, of this stuff and the world is full of people that think this way and think that this is fine and don't have a problem with it. But look at what he says. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer, a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. This is such a serious sin that, look, if someone's called a brother, someone in church, a saved, born-again believer in God, someone who's called a brother is a fornicator, don't even eat with that person. Don't have anything to do with that person. That's the way that fornication ought to be viewed and dealt with today. People say, oh, you got to love that person. You got to open up to that. No, look, if they're considered a brother... Don't even eat with them. That's the love they need. It's the tough love. It's no longer just open arms. Oh, we're all sinners. No, look. We need to hold ourselves to a standard. A biblical standard. So if someone's a member of the church and you know, they're saved and they're considered a brother, they've been, they, they understand God's law. It's not like they just got saved yesterday. They've been coming to church for a while. They know these things. They know better. If they're a drunkard or a fornicator or covetous, then don't even eat with that person. Yeah. Turn, if you would, to uh, chapter 6. Just one chapter over. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse number 9. The Bible reads, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. He's saying, look, don't you know that the fornicators, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God? Don't you, knowing this, do you think you should just go out and just actively participate in this? The, the fornicators, idolaters, you know, all this stuff. He's saying, but you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been set apart the moment you got saved. You were washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. So you know along of these things, you ought not to be partaker in those things. You need to stay away from them completely. He says, look, all things are lawful unto me because I'm washed. That's what we just got done saying in the previous verse. Look, you're washed. All things are lawful unto me. Christ paid for all of my sins, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I'm not going to be brought back under that bondage of sin. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. He's saying, look, your body is not just to go and, and, and satisfy your flesh 
by sleeping around and lying with other with with men or women or whatever out of out of marriage. That's not what your body is for. He says your body is for the Lord. And the Lord for by and God hath not raised up the Lord and will also excuse me and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. And notice again, the usage of the word harlot with the fornication. Exactly what we saw in Genesis 34. The fornication was committed and they're saying, should he deal with our sister as a harlot? Because when you commit fornication, that's what you're doing. And he's saying, look, your body is made for God. God owns your body. Your body is the temple of Christ. They're the members of Christ. He's saying, should I gonna take the members of Christ and make them a member of an harlot? Are you going to drag God down that low as to just defile your body, which it belongs unto God, and just, and just make it the member of a harlot because the two flesh becomes one? You're going to take a member of Christ and make it the member of, of something that's, you know, a harlot that's wicked? It says, What know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body belongs unto God. When you join your body with someone else, you become one flesh. Hey, your body is the temple of God. Your body belongs unto God. He's bought you and paid for you. Don't go and make your, your flesh one with an harlot. Don't go and commit fornication and defile the temple of God. This is strong language and we need to... We need to view sin, view fornication in this way. Ephesians 5.3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetous, let it not be once named among you as become of saints. That is not how a saint ho carries himself. That is not how they act. We are to be held to a high standard in this world. We need to be able to keep the testimony of Jesus Christ so that we're not just like the world and people can't just look at us and be like, well, what's the difference? Here's someone who says they're a Christian and they're out fornicating. He says, no, don't even let it be once named among you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. It's your holiness, it's your, your cleansing and becoming more, more like Jesus, more like God. Your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Honor. There's a good word. There's a word that, that people don't seem to have much respect for anymore. Men and women who are honorable. Men and women who hold themselves to a standard. Men and women who are can say something and it actually means something because you're not a liar because you're not a fornicator you could actually make a vow to somebody and say hey as long as we live I'm not going to leave you or depart from you through good times and bad I'm going to make a vow to you and I'm going to stick to that word I'm going to stick to that promise that's called being honorable being someone that people can look to and have respect for because you don't just give in to every lust of your flesh. You're not just covetous and fornicating and, and doing all these things and have no self-control, no dignity. Don't be like the animals. The animals go and just commit fornication. We have a stud dog here that, you know, as soon as the, the, one of the other dogs in heat, that's all he can think about and that's all he can do. Why? Because he's an animal. But you're not an animal. You're a person. You're a human being. You need to control yourself and have, and have self-respect. Have respect for God Almighty. You're saved. You've got the temple of God is your body. 
have respect under that and control yourself, show temperance and, and show that ability to not just give in to every lustly, fleshly desire and have value for something that is, that is bigger than just what's going to satisfy me at this moment. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word, dear God, for your word, not these false perversions of your word, dear God. We thank you for preserving your word for us. Even today in 2015, we thank you that you have promised to do it, that you have kept your words pure and that we could learn from them. God, I pray that at least, I know the world's always going to be full of sinners. And the world's always going to be full of fornicators and extortioners and drunkards and, and the like, dear Lord. But I pray that in your house and among your people, we could live with a higher standard, with a standard that is consistent with what you've taught in, in your word, dear Lord, that, that we can be a people that have honor, that have dignity, that have respect, dear Lord. Help us to teach our children the old path wherein is the right way, dear God. Help us to teach them the extreme folly in fornication and how much it's going to damage them and ruin their lives if they get caught up into this sin, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just continue to lead us and direct us and keep us safe in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.